Stepler, and I'm a junior majoring in journalism at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. A Hill District native, Sally Udine has decades of leadership and social justice activism throughout his career. A freedom rider, someone who has marched on Washington, and a former city council person and current school board member, Udine has spent his life championing for equality. I spoke with Mr. Udine about the 1960s Hill District, the evolution of the civil rights movement, and the black media in Pittsburgh. Describe what it was like being there in Washington, D.C. on August 28, 1963. I just turned 20. I had never been to Washington, D.C., had never participated in a demonstration, and had never been in a crowd that gigantic. It was like I was in some kind of fantasy land. Everybody was energized and shouting various slogans and marching. It was unbelievable. I felt a great sense of empowerment that I was a part of something huge. And I was a witness to something historical. I knew that much. So I felt extremely empowered and included and proud to have been included in something as historical as that event. Now what drove you to be there that day? NAACP Youth Council, Staten Island, New York. That's where I was living at the time. The Youth Council was invited to join the adult chapter in this trip to Washington, D.C. I was the chairman of the Youth Council and they offered us the opportunity to take some of the seats on the bus that they had not filled. We create a movement among the youth council members, an event to fill those seats. It was maybe a half dozen seats. And by the time we finished building up the event among the youth council, there were a lot more people who wanted to join the march. There were enough people to fill a second bus. Now, the words Martin Luther King Jr. echoed over the mall that day are actually used in journalism classes today for budding reporters to learn how to write up event coverage and speeches. In 1963, how did media respond to that speech? They responded in a way that was appropriate to historic events. And they were covering historic events. They knew it and they covered it as such. They focused in primarily on Dr. Martin Luther King. They focused also on the other speakers who were present that day. There was a context among the speakers, especially there was concern about certain speakers who the leaders did not want to speak, or if they were going to speak, they had to show their speech in advance and have the leaders approve or edit those speeches so that the event would not get a blemish from somebody's speech. The media covered the size of the event, the historic importance of the event, the location of the event, the issues that were being raised by the sponsors of the march directed towards the president and the Congress and the demands that were being made for voting rights and jobs. Those were the demands of the march. Transitioning back to Pittsburgh, how would you explain a 1960s Hill District to someone? What was the Hill District like in the 60s? In the beginning of the 60s, it was a ethnically mixed working class community just to the east of downtown Pittsburgh, a, a neighborhood that was home to a lot of new refugees to Pittsburgh. 
Pittsburgh was one of those locations that they could come to because the word was out that you could get a good paying job, although the work was hard, in coal mines and in steel mills and in some factories. The work was hard, but the pay was good. And so a lot of people who were coming north found their way east over toward Pittsburgh. So it was a ethnically mixed neighborhood. Uh, it was segregated racially and by class from the rest of the city neighborhoods. It was a self-contained neighborhood. It had or most of the things that a neighborhood needed. It had that kind of mix of commercial life and a ethnic mix and a class mix. There were unemployed, there were street sweepers, there were rubbish men living right amongst dentists and doctors and nurses and school teachers and preachers all lived together in that neighborhood. They worked hard and they partied hard. Now, um, on April 5th, 1968, after Dr. King's assassination, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette's front page headline read, King assassinated in Memphis, LBJ delays trip to Honolulu. Then the Pittsburgh Courier's April 13th edition front page headline read, A Nation Mourns, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., 1929 to 1968. And the Pittsburgh Press ran a front page headline, LBJ calls Congress on King, asks day for morning Sunday. What was the role of the black press in Pittsburgh in the 1960s? Allow me, if you will, to put the car in reverse and go back again to the early part of the 1960s in the Hill District. If we go back to the early 1960s, a very important part of the neighborhood transition was the fact that the city of Pittsburgh was demolishing the lower one-third of the Hill District neighborhood and displacing 8,000 families and organizations from that neighborhood. There was a lot of mixed feelings about that decision and about that demolition because it was so large and so impactful and it moved so many people out of the neighborhood and it created for the first time racial segregation in housing because a decision had to be made where do we put these people? They decided that black people needed to go in one area and white and non-black people needed to go somewhere else. So there was a racial separation in housing availability. But the fact that the city was demolishing the most historic and successful portion of the Hill District neighborhood had a tremendous impact on the rest of the Hill District. That was a significant part of the Hill District reality at that time from the late 50s to the early 60s. So if we race ahead to the late 1960s and of the period of the 1968, close to Dr. Martin Luther King's assassination, before the assassination, that period was a period that was in upheaval as well. The Hill District, like the rest of the African American community nationwide, was in an uproar about voting rights, about joblessness and poverty, about police brutality and the lack of political empowerment, poor housing, 
poor health care, poor schools, the African American community of of the Hill District felt that impoverishment and that lack of empowerment very strongly and fought back very strongly against it. There were demonstrations downtown for the right to have jobs in places downtown where we could buy clothes, but we couldn't work in those clothing stores. The movement for civil rights and justice in the Hill District reflected the movement for civil rights and voting rights among African Americans in the rest of the country. Those people and that fight affected the people of Pittsburgh. The people of Pittsburgh took up that fight here in Pittsburgh, heavily influenced by what was going on around the nation. There was quite a bit of conflict that that created dry grass and all it needed was a spark. And the assassination of Dr. King was that spark. The assassination of Dr. King was so impactful among people who had never laid eyes on Dr. King, but revered him as their leader and spokesperson for all of the ills that they were fighting for before Dr. King was assassinated. There was a hot movement afoot from the beginning of the 60s all the way up until the late 60s. The, as I said, the grass was dry, just waiting for a spark, and the assassination provided that spark. April 20th, 1968, the Pittsburgh Courier asked on the front page, Will New King emerge? Has a new king emerged? No. I don't know that a new king will ever emerge. The world keeps asking the movement of Black Lives Matter, who is your leader? And they respond, we are all leaders. We have not identified a single leader because we still feel the pain of your assassination of our single leader, Dr. Martin Luther King, and so many other single leaders. When we identify single leaders, you assassinate them. So we're gonna create a movement that does not have an identified single leader. Now, how have public protests for social justice issues changed or morphed over time? The fact that they they are organized horizontally rather than vertically. And the leadership is dispersed more horizontally than vertically. The other thing that I think has changed the movement recently is in 1974, there was a increased attention to political power and using political power to add heat to the fire for civil rights and voting rights. And as we began to increase the number of elected officials in Congress, at the state legislatures, in city councils, those elected officials became instruments of change. The temperature of the fight for justice increased exponentially to the extent that we increased the number of political elected officials. So the fire was hotter. Demands were more specific and of greater import. The fight also became a part of the global fight of African Americans and third world people of color all over the world. People identified pockets of struggle in various places around the world and started to reach out and form connections with those movements around the world. They reached out here within the United States to include relationships of struggle with Latinos, with women, with anti-war protesters, with LGBTQI advocates, with indigenous
indigenous population. The movement was no longer just African American. It was a human rights span and scope. And it was international. And those kinds of outreaches were made to Canada, to Mexico, to the Caribbean, to Latin America, to Africa, to Europe. So it became global and it became hotter. In 1968, Pennsylvania Governor Raymond Schaefer mobilized National Guard troops to Pittsburgh and Pittsburgh City Mayor Joseph Barr imposed a five-day daily cur- curfew in April. Do today's protests remind you of the protests in Pittsburgh after King's assassination? The Black Lives Matter movement is an outgrowth of the fight against police brutality that during the 60s was named Stop Killer Cops, and now it's Black Lives Matter. It has evolved but it is the same struggle, the same fight. The methods, the spokespeople are different. The demands are different, but the fight for justice is the same. Arrests in the Hill District, riots of 1968. How did the media respond to that? Were they portrayed accurately? Never accurately. Always from the perspective of the power structure. The media are businesses that are owned by the power structure and they are influenced by the power structure. And when they speak, they speak from the perspective and in the interests of the power structure. That's how they see and write stories around our story. What you're hearing from the media is not hardly ever our story. You're hearing their perspective of our story. And that's how the media has always reacted and probably will always react. What are your earliest memories of the black press and how influential was that on your life? When I was in my early teens, I was a paper boy for the Pittsburgh Courier. I used to go every Thursday after school to the Courier's office, pick up a bunch of newspapers and hustle those newspapers in the street, calling out, Courier, Courier, Pittsburgh Courier. The role of the Courier was to flex social, cultural, political, business life, athletic life, society pages. It reflected the the fullness of black social life in Pittsburgh a week late. So whatever happened this week, you could probably find it in next week's Courier. But a week late didn't bother anybody because at least it got into a newspaper. And if you had enough consciousness to care about what was going on in the community, every week you grabbed a courier and you'd read it and know what was going on among black people, not only in the Hill District, but throughout the city of Pittsburgh and throughout the nation. The white media didn't cover what was going on in the black community and if they did cover something it was probably a violent incident and they covered it from the perspective of the way they see the black community so if you want to know what really happened you had to read the courier or you had to listen to the black radio station at that time it was w-a-m-o whammo It had the news, it had music, it had events, announcements, and it was an abbreviated and more timely reflection of what you could read in the Courier. Now, um, we'll have to leave it at there. Thank you very much 